I'm Mary Abedinsky, Dean of the Faculty of Law at UBC, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this wonderful UBC event that brings together students, alumni, and other members of the broader UBC community uh, to hear two outstanding UBC graduates uh, speak. Uh, we have with us today two people who need no introduction, and yet here I stand. Uh, so I will be as brief as possible so as not to uh, improve on the time of our speakers. We have Catherine Gretzinger well-known voice of our national radio, specifically CBC's The Afternoon Show. She graduated from UBC with a master's in journalism in 2006 and is now sharing her experience with UBC journalism students as an adjunct faculty member. Uh, we don't often get to see radio personalities in person, and so this is a wonderful treat for us. We also have Kim Campbell, described as a woman of firsts. Among her well-known firsts, she was the first uh, female uh, president of the freshman class, uh, first of um, female justice minister and attorney general of Canada. She was minister of national defense of Canada uh, and the first uh, minister, female minister of uh, veteran affairs. And of course, uh, among many firsts, uh, the first female prime minister of Canada. Uh, and uh, we are delighted that she has both a BA and a uh, LLB from University of British Columbia uh, and an honorary degree awarded in 2000. Uh, she's received many awards and distinctions, including an award of distinction from the UBC Alumni Association. She's a companion to the Order of Canada and a recipient of the Queen Elizabeth uh, II uh, Gold, Golden Jubilee Medal. Uh, and I think my time for introductions has actually expired. And so let me just invite you to warmly welcome our distinguished guest to this wonderful event. Wood. <laughs> well, why don't you sing to fill time until we're mic'd? Actually, Kim Campbell could sing for you this afternoon and sing very well, I might add. Well, to cries of don't quit your day job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming home and spending some time with all of us this afternoon. It's great to be here, even in the rain. It shows you how homesick I am, folks. <laughs> you know, a lot of people succeed in the world and then they come home and they keep their heads down, they spend time with friends and family, they go to their favorite restaurants. When you come home, you always make it a point to come back to UBC, to speak to the public broadcaster, to do events. How come? Well, because you nag me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. Um, uh, I often say I didn't plan to make a career out of being a former prime minister, but it's, um, it's a bit like having gum on your shoe, you know, it sort of sticks. But it's also, um, you know, I, I was saying to a group of people last night, so much of what I do now is a result of my life here, and I feel very connected to it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later, I think you wanted to talk about democracy promotion. And thanks to the voters of Vancouver, uh, I held elected office at all three levels of government in Canada, and I learned a great deal. It was as, as much a part of my education as what I did in the classroom here at UBC. And so I feel very connected and very, uh, very grateful for what I learned here. And uh, so it's sort of nice to come back and say to people, no, I'm still alive. And, um, and I hope making good use of the lessons that, uh, that many people worked very hard to let me have. So it's, uh, it's, I, I feel a sense of, of, of obligation, but also great friendship. I mean, this is, you know, these are your peeps. Friends. Yeah, it's in my, it's in my gang. You know, and, and and it's also a great pleasure for me to see people uh, grow and change, and uh, you know, people who were doing very different things when I was in, in office. Now, you know, having successful businesses and families, whatever. So, the continuity pleases me. It makes me happy. So much was made in 1993 of your becoming the first female prime minister in Canada. It's 17 years later. You're still the only female Prime Minister. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on where we're at in terms of gender and democracy in this country? Well, I must say it does discourage me that I don't see a woman on the horizon you know, looking, you know, looking likely to be able to do that. And um, I think there still are a lot of challenges. You know, there's, somebody has written a paper, they talk about the glass, what they call the glass precipice, that when parties are in a, in a pickle, then you know, the women are supposed to pull the rabbit out of the hat, and maybe that had something to do with how I got to be leader. It may have been part of it. I don't think it was entirely it, because in fact, when I first went to Ottawa, 
Uh, I would go and speak at you know, constituencies of my colleagues, and people would say to me, when Brian Mulroney steps down, you're going to be our next leader, which was actually kind of horrifying, because you know, there's no vacancy. You don't want to be seen to be you know, an applicant for the job. <laughs> but, um, Hasn't deterred the liberals in <laughs> the province, though, has it? <laughs> but it's, um, you know, I, I think that, I mean, politics is hard for women. This is a big country, so at the national level, it's diff difficult. I think at the provincial and local level, uh, it's a little easier for, for women to do it, but I just see so many remarkable women, and uh, uh, and I, you know I belong to this organization, the Council of Women World Leaders, which is women presidents and prime ministers, both current and former, and there are now about eight, 38 of us, and you know I, these women are, are quite remarkable. You know I look at some of the women who've recently retired, Chandrika Kumaratunga of Sri Lanka, uh, Michelle Bachelet of, of Chile, and you know these are you know women can do it, they can and should do it, and. Uh, Parties need to make it possible to recruit the best women into their ranks and to build the strength in the, in the, uh, the cabinets and the ministries to give women experience. Although men don't worry about having experience, they're quite happy to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have a friend who's a, 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 quite an expert on gender issues and uh, she worked for a, a major uh, investment bank in New York developing their global leadership and, and uh, diversity program. It's a major bank. I won't mention the name except that it's been much vilified lately. You can probably guess. But anyway, she, she went around the world interviewing their employees and she discovered that the only people in this huge investment bank who thought it was a meritocracy were white men. Uh, nobody else thought it was a meritocracy. But the other thing is she says that men have positive illusions. So if you go out into the streets of, say, Canada or the United States, you say to a, you know, a man, you know, you could be prime minister. He says, oh yeah, well, I don't really have time, but, you know, yes, I probably <laughs> But if you say that to a woman, you know, even if she's just leapt tall buildings in a single bound, she will tell you all the reasons why she can't do it. And, um, you know, and I don't, that's kind of a stereotype, but I, I think that, that women often do uh, need a lot of persuading that they're, that they're good at things, that they can do things. And there are a lot of things that you start to do with a basic set of skills, but that you also learn while doing. I mean, there isn't really any school to be a prime minister. And you, you observe and you watch others. But, you know, Brian Mulroney became prime minister. He had never held a line ministry. He uh, had never been elected to parliament until a year before he became prime minister when he served as leader of the opposition. He was elected leader of the party. Um, uh, Elmer McKay gave up his seat. He was elected in Nova Scotia and they served as leader of the opposition. So he'd never run a line ministry. And you know, if you said to a woman who'd, never, who'd done those same things, you know, why don't you run? People would say, oh no, I couldn't do that. Need uh, more know, experience. Yeah. I mean, I guess Belinda Stronach went through that, through that as well when, when, when she tried to do it. But it's, uh, it's just that there are, you know, and it, all sorts of you know, sort of self-indulgent men who, and you see this in the United States, sort of putting themselves forward to be president, men who've sort of never done anything. But you know, where are the equally self-indulgent women with positive? But illusion? do we want <laughs> do we want those self-indulgent people to be our leaders? Yeah. Well, actually, it just occurred to me that there maybe there was an exception in the United States, and I better <laughs> <laughs> I better quit while I'm ahead. But, but you know, I think here's what I would say. Here's what I would say. I do not believe that we should have more women in politics because women are better. I don't believe that. Uh, some of the people I admire most in the world, some of the people who have supported me most strongly, some people who have been my inspiration, are men. But the point is that there are lots of wonderful women, and what women bring is the fact that they, in some ways, lead, see the world differently. They live a different kind of life, and they have a different set of strengths to bring and a different set of weaknesses to be compensated for. And there's lots of research that shows that when you have diversity in decision making, you get better decisions. That you don't get the same kind of group think or the kind of reinforcing of certain kinds of, of group dynamics that happen in, in homogeneous groups of people. So that's my, that's my concern, that I think there are a lot of gifted women who could make a wonderful contribution. And I think women have a lot to learn from men about how to use power and how to uh, uh, operate in these kinds of environments. I think men are often much better at it than we are, in the same way that men have a lot to learn from women in how to get the most out of the processes of, of policy building, how to reach out and, and consult and uh, question your own assumptions uh, without worrying that somehow you're losing face to do so. So I think it's, uh, to me, diversity is really the answer. And, and gender diversity is one of the fundamental characteristics, but then you also need diversity in terms of ethnic background, generation, particularly today with the technology changes. I think generational diversity is extremely important. Um, and just different kinds of perspectives on the world. Given that uh, democracy in Canada continues to be largely driven by um, white males of a certain age, what does that say about the state of our democracy in this country right now? Well, I think we may sometimes be 
a bit uh, over-optimistic in how quickly one can make cultural change. And, you know, by the time children start school, they have a very deeply embedded notion of what it means to be male and female in their society. And a lot of that comes not just from what they hear in their homes, but what they see. And if they don't see a lot of them, one of the things that, that was important for me and, and, and what a lot of my supporters felt when I became prime minister was that this created a new visual that young people looking could say, well, you know, here is a woman and she's doing this. And that's why I'm sorry I wasn't there longer, just if only to be, you know, for the demonstration effect of, of <laughs> being there. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so I think it, it does take a lot longer. And there's so many, th I was at a, a conference at Harvard recently, uh, the, the Council of Women World Leaders, we sponsored it with the Kennedy School, looking at the business case for diversity. And there's a lot of research that shows that even when you have diverse bodies of people, there are ways in which decision making still gets skewed. In other words, there's, there's still a lot we have to learn about how we interact with each other and how our preconceptions and predispositions influence the way we perceive, uh, the way we evaluate certain messages that we hear. There, but the one nice thing, and, I, and it's important to say this in a university, the one nice thing about the advances in social psychology, cognitive psychology, doing some very, very interesting work, is that we can kind of get to the bottom of these things. We can understand that it isn't just mean people trying to keep you know, nice women out of office. It's that we are all the product of our society. There is an inter interesting test you can take online um, that was developed by some psychologists, psychologists at Harvard called the Implicit Attitude Test. I think it's like IAT.com. But if you put in Implicit Attitude Test in Google, you'll find it. And many, many years ago, I took this test. And what happens is they flash images and you kind of respond to how you associate with it. It could be science or whatever. And I discovered that I associated men with science more than women. Well, you know throw myself out of a basement window and despair. <laughs> but what that means is, it's, I mean, I certainly intellectually strongly support the rights of women to be scientists. But it means I come from a culture and a society where women just aren't as visible as scientists. And we're all products of that. So we're constantly struggling between our intellectual views and our kind of conscious views of how we think the world should be and the values and the reflex and kind of visceral programming that is part of simply being in a human society. And so when we have these hypotheses that we lay down uh, from the time that we're born, and maybe even before we're born, about who gets to do what, uh, that influence our, our reactions. For example, when I was prime minister, it was very interesting, and particularly the Ottawa Press Gallery. <laughs> you see, don't look at me like that. I wasn't there. No, you're not. You're not. You're okay. But seriously, the reporters in the Ottawa Press Gallery, you may not know it, but they own the political process. And if they didn't make you, uh, and they don't quite understand how you got there, they're very disturbed. There's a kind of a visceral discomfort. And uh, you know, I remember one of one of the reporters who shall go and name, but he has the same last name as the royal family, um, <laughs> said to me one time with a visible curl of the lip, "I've known every prime minister since Lester Pearson," and the. Implication was, and you don't look or sound like any of them. And you know, my reaction was, well, Rudy, really toot toot for you. But the point was, I didn't look or sound like any of them. And for him, it was like, ooh, I didn't fit there. And so, but we all have that. It's not just this particularly obnoxious person. But when people <laughs> have that kind of very deep sense of how they think the world should work, and you come along and you don't fit in with it, you can have a real problem. You will never get the benefit of the doubt. And people will look for reasons to validate their visceral discomfort at your presence. So you will say something, oh, very interesting, when I did a paper uh, after political retirement had been thrust upon me, I spent about a year at the Kennedy School, first at the Institute of Politics and then at the Joan Shorenstein Center for the Study of Press and Politics. And in the second fellowship, I was supposed to write a paper on some aspect of the press and politics. And I had just started negotiating a contract to write a memoir. And I thought, well, maybe I could do something about the press coverage of the 93 election. I'm going to have to write about it in my book anyway. And I had a big uh, archive, you know, that the uh, Privy Council office puts out a brick every day of all the press clippings, depending on what it's about. So during the election, I had a brick of all the press clippings across the country that dealt with the election. I had transcripts of all of my uh, press scrums. I had transcripts of all of my television and radio interviews. So I had the whole archive of my involvement with the press. And what was fascinating was, and I said, you know, I can't be objective about this. So what I need to do is find some topics. So I thought I'll write about 
what the press thinks about the coverage. And there was a theme throughout the coverage, and the theme was how unfair the coverage was, without any effort to explain why. And so somebody would write, you know, uh, uh, Kim Campbell said such and such, and we jumped all over her, and Jean Chrétien said the same thing, and we left him alone. Gee, that Jean Chrétien sure can manipulate the media. <laughs> but the point was that Jean Chrétien could put both feet up to his knees, and you know, and any other <laughs> appendage. I don't mean that he physically could do this, but you know, metaphorically, he could do this. But you see, he belonged there. And so if he made a funny comment or said something, he goes, well, that's just Jean Chrétien. If I even put a tiny little toenail <laughs> between my lips, it was, you see, you see, she doesn't belong there. And, and I actually see a lot of this in the coverage of the current president of the United States, this kind of underlying looking for a reason to vote. And that doesn't mean he doesn't make mistakes. And actually, part of the problem is, it, when you're looking at the coverage, that's why I didn't try to write about my own views of the coverage. I thought, what do journalists say about it? Because it is hard to parse out what are, in fact, the actual mistakes you make. I'm not perfect. I make lots of mistakes. From those which people attribute to that you didn't make. And of course, the famous one was the opening statement of the election, when I supposedly said there'd be no new jobs till the year 2000, which I never said for a nanosecond. You know, when will employment, unemployment reach you know, acceptable levels? I said two, three, four years. Then, taking a breath, looking at something totally different, I said, because I'd been talking about getting the deficit under control, I look forward to the year 2000, because you may recall we were sort of beginning to think about millennium, when you know, unemployment will be way down and we'll be paying down the deficit and there'll be a whole new uh, prospect for Canadians. But, I mean, Jean Chrétien's a very smart politician and he grabs it, you know, Kim Campbell says no new jobs of the year 2000. But everybody jumped on the bandway. You know, and then there was a big debate about whether I was just being honest, and, and so I was getting you know, debated about the, the validity of something I never actually said. But, but, when, but, when, but when you're the person that's in that situation, it's very frustrating because you can't quite figure it out. And at the time, I didn't really understand it. I then went on to teach a course called Gender and Power at the Kennedy School, which really gave me a chance to get into a lot of the very good academic uh, literature that looks at these kinds of, of uh, perceptual challenges. And, and I found it very, very helpful. I mean, it was too late for me, but it was interesting to do it. But the, what, did, the, what did you find? Well, just the, the, the research that shows, for example, there's a very good book by Virginia Vallian, who's a social psychologist, called Why So Slow the Advancement of Women. And she talks about the gender schemas, the kind of frameworks and sets of hypotheses that we create from our very uh, tiniest days about what it means to be male and female and how these influence us. But there's just tons of, of very excellent research out that, that shows to what extent <coughs> leadership is gendered masculine and how hard it is to, to get beyond that. It's not impossible, but the fundamental thing for getting beyond it is for women to be there because we need to change the landscape from which people derive their sense of how the world works. And if women are there, even if they have a hard time, you know, I, you know, I would very much like to have been prime minister longer. Um, there are a lot of things I can you know, look at in, in the, that period of time that were very painful and difficult, but I don't for a nanosecond regret being there because I get letters all the time from little kids. We're doing a project on the, in social <coughs> studies on the prime ministership and I'm writing about you. And I think if I'm not there, there's no woman for them to write about. And, you know, and I created a website, kimcampbell.com, if you remember. <laughs> We're not selling anything, there's no advertising. But, but, you know, I created that because I think this is important mm. that, and not just for little girls, for little boys, to know that this is something that there was a woman there. Uh, it my, changed. my son is nine, and he said, when I said what I was doing today, I'm going to speak to a former prime minister, and her name is Kim Campbell, and he said, a girl, and I said, no, a woman. <laughs> and then he said, that is so cool. He didn't even yeah. know that that was possible. But that's why I think it is important, and, and there are so many remarkable women in so many fields, and, and academia is not the easiest field area for women. I, you know, I'm in the middle of the university, so I'll restrain some of my more pungent comments that I can make, but it is a hard environment. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of women have really struggled against the, the kind of the skepticism, I think, which is the, the, the hardest part, to just be there and do well and be excellent. You know, we just, uh, you know, having lunch with the dean, you know, he's, and, and Marianne's not even the first woman dean of the UBC Law School. Yay, I mean, there, there was a time when this would have been almost unthinkable. And what women went through to be accepted into the legal profession, and yet now all over, as both as practicing lawyers and scholars and officials and policymakers, I mean, they're doing all sorts of wonderful things. So the fact that women put up with the guff to make it possible for subsequent generations of women 
to be much more accepted, and, and, and they did this by their excellence, is really, really important. And, but in public life, I would, I would be much happier to see more women, because I think that, A, they do it very well, and it's very important, and they provide a, an important aspect of diversity to the decision-making process. When did you become so passionate about democracy? The, the question of it, the pursuit of it? Well, you know, it's very interesting because I was thinking uh, a few weeks ago, I was uh, giving a commencement address at the University of Alberta, and I was thinking how we all live in the same present, but depending on how old we are, we see it very differently. And it was almost shocking for me to think that I was talking to a group of students for whom the Second World War was farther away than the First World War was for my generation. Uh, you know, when I, my, my parents were both in uniform in the Second World War. In the First World War, we know you'd go to our Armistice Day and there'd be the old First World War veterans. But for this group of students, the Second World War is farther away than that. So we see it differently in how we interpret things and, and, and what sense we make of it. It depends very much on what our past has been, even though we're all together in the same present. And because I was born right after the war, and both my parents were in uniform in the war, and if you'll remember in the early days of television, you know, the world at war narrated by Sir Lawrence Olivier, I and mean, all these wonderful programs and documentaries. I mean, the Second World War was a, a, an extraordinary experience. And I very much, you know, became, kind of not obsessed is the wrong word, but just very fascinated by it. Fascinated by Hitler and what he did. And I remember when I was in high school, and I discovered that I could move people when I spoke. It actually scared me because I knew that that was one of the things we learned about Hitler, that he was this very kind of charismatic speaker and he kind of would get people, you know, the, I'm always afraid of, of leaders who appeal primarily to my anger because we all have buttons you can push. You know, out here in British Columbia, you can push our buttons about, you know, we don't get no respect where the Rodney danger fills of confederation and, you know. <laughs> I mean, we all have buttons because the world isn't perfect and we all have, have things that, that causes that can make us excited. But once our buttons are pushed and we're foaming at the mouth, we're not really uh, in the best position to, you know, solve problems or move the world forward in a, in a great way. So We have to come back and talk about the Tea Party now that you've said that, <laughs> shall we? Okay. But anyway, that was, I, I became very, uh, very interested in you know how these things happen, mm. but it's interesting. I didn't see myself as a politician because I came from Vancouver. I was far away from the national capital, and my parents you know voted, but they weren't particularly active in politics. I wanted to be the first woman secretary general of the UN. That's what I wanted to be. Was to make you know I wasn't going to be Miss America, so I could say I wanted world peace. So I had to be <laughs> secretary general of the UN. Because I was anyway, there were your choices, honey, if you wanted world peace. <laughs> so anyway. But, but, you know, it, but it did matter to me because, and, and I remember I used to lie in bed and I'd read these books and I'd sort of think all these people who got killed and I think, you know, each one of them was like a person like me and they had kind of a consciousness and it, and it would overwhelm me. I mean, I just couldn't fathom it. So that was why, I, I guess, so from a very young age, I wanted to do something to make the world not be like that, not, not have that kind of conflict again. And then as I got older, politics became something that seemed to be a, a you know, a reasonable vehicle for those kinds of, of instincts and desires. And so school board then you to try to take a run at uh, provincial politics, end up going and running And federally. aren't you sorry I didn't win the leadership at the social credit party? <laughs> but there wouldn't have been a fantasy gardens. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever do you mean? Through the heart. <laughs> When you you look see, I'm not running for anything, you see, and I just, I come back and I go, ooh, there's this sort of sense of deja vu in the air. <laughs> okay, we better talk about I've what's... have seen those teeth before? <laughs> Would you like to tell us what you think... There's a certain generational tone to the laughter. There. <laughs> <laughs> Don't impose your values on our audience, please. <laughs> I just mean, uh, Gordon Campbell. Mm -hmm. uh, just a few months ago, he was riding the wave of popularity, running around with his red scarf um, during the Olympics, uh, feeling great, so proud of the province. Um, now he, he was at 9% in the polls the week before he decided to pull the plug. I was never at 9%. <laughs> Actually, Gallup had you as the most popular prime minister ever at one point during your campaign. Um, now, Gordon Campbell. So it shows, shows you that there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of what's gone on with him? Well, first of all, um, as I mentioned on your esteemed uh, radio station this morning, um, 
first of all, I don't live here, so I'm not going to give you great detailed comments about the politics here. But what struck me is that, uh, from press coverage I read, that, I mean, Gordon Campbell, I think, has done a great job. And I think he's made a huge contribution to the province and, and to Vancouver as, as mayor before. Uh, but he got caught up in an issue of the, the harmonized tax, uh, where he perceived not to have been candid with the electorate before an election about it. And, you know, I was part of the government that brought in the GST. Uh, and, you know, we didn't bring it in to be mean. We had a, a tax that was not working, the, the federal sales tax, that was uh, prejudicing our exports and costing us jobs. And looking at how to replace it, a multi-stage value-added tax was by far the best result. But they are difficult, they're annoying to people because they're administratively complex. But that same complexity is also what tends to make them fair and, and difficult to evade. And so we took the, the leap and brought in the GST knowing that it would be very unpopular. And if you may recall in the 93 election, the Liberals were all saying they were going to get rid of it. And Sheila Cobb said, well, if I don't get rid of it, I'm going to resign. And they didn't get rid of it. And then she was forced to resign and run again just because she'd said that. But, but the point is that very often, you know, parties, you know, are, are really glad that the other side brought in the good but controversial policies because it means they don't have to take the heat for it. And I think the harmonization is probably a good idea, probably you know, in the business sense and if you need to balance it with other things. But how you do things is really important. And to do something in a way that loses the trust of the electorate, I think is, you know, but he's very a, dangerous. He's a veteran politician. Yeah. That, that seems like, like politics 101, don't tell people one thing and do something else, they get mad. So how can this happen? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm neither his wife nor his shrink, so I, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, even, go even good people make mistakes, or even good people may say, oh, well, the hell though, we need to do this, or I don't want to get into another. I, I don't know. I mean, you have to get him on the stage and ask him. But I do think it's a pity, because I think what it does is it puts a complexion on a political career that really deserves uh, a better evaluation. And I think we'll, he, will, he will get that. But I'm just sorry to see him step down under those circumstances. If he said, look, you know, enough is enough, I'm tired, time to you know, bring in new people, that's one thing. But uh, you know, so it, it, it's, it's too bad. But you know, it's also part of the democratic process. You know, even on election night in 1993, uh, when we had been pummeled, to put it mildly, there's still something inside that you say, you know, but it's a democratic process. <laughs> and even if you think the voters are wrong, the voters are never wrong because they can make the decision. And particularly now that I do a lot of work in democracy promotion in other parts of the world, it's actually kind of miraculous that people defeat governments and the governments leave the stage and they come back and they fight another day and sometimes they get reelected you know, back and forth, it's, it, it's all a matter of selling your message and trying to uh, win support for it. And it's such a wonderful thing. And the only way it works is to have to have a loser. Every election, there has to be losers. And the ability to lose an argument and to lose an election gracefully are one of the hallmarks of a democratic mindset. And, you know, we take it for granted. And I remember the night of the election in 93 when I, you know, wished Prime Minister-elect and his wife, well, and you have know, some people in the audience went, so, but you know, it is a wonderful thing. And he, the burdens were not going to be his. And he needed our support and loyal opposition. You know, fair to criticize, fair to critique, fair to hold the government accountable, fair to offer an alternative vision. But the person who's been legitimately elected has the right even to make mistakes, has the right to be wrong. And I'm actually just going, I'm flying out tonight to Kiev where on Thursday I'll be participating in a big public panel called What is Freedom of Speech? And in former Soviet countries, because the party governed by virtue of the pretense that it had the highest level of consciousness, of course, if you criticized it, you were challenging the fundamental legitimacy of those in office. So, of course, it was subversive and you had to be hammered down. But in a democracy, people are still legitimately in office, even if they make mistakes. The public will replace them if they decide in the next election, or they may forgive them and return them, if they, or if they think there isn't an alternative. But it, it's a whole different philosophy, and we expect people to speak their minds, because it's part of the discourse that goes into figuring out what you, what you should do and what you can do, because sometimes what you should do is maybe not politically sustainable at this stage, and you have to build a constituency for it, whatever. So it's a very, very different philosophy and approach to how we speak. And, uh, 
So at the end of the day, even, even losing is part of a winning scenario in the sense that it reflects the exercise of a democratic mandate. And it's a great and wonderful thing. And there are a lot of people in the world who would very much like to have you know, even our crazy politics. Uh, can we talk for a moment about what's going on in Haiti? Um, it seems to me, as somebody who has spent as much time as you have thinking about how do you foster democracy in countries that have not had histories of strong democracies, looking at what's happened there with the election over the weekend, the international community has been full of uh, bluster and rhetoric, but nobody's doing anything um, yet. Uh, what, what ought to happen in Haiti? Well, I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I think that uh, there, that a government that is not legitimate, if people are not confident, will be a government that can't do anything. And it may mean that the international community will have to try and, and uh, uh, prevail upon the Haitians to have another election, to step back a little bit. I mean, I just don't know. But it is, it, it is, it is sad. You know, I um, belong to an organization called the Club of Madrid, an organization of former presidents and prime ministers. And we had a conference, or annual meeting recently, where we had a very interesting discussion on Haiti, because we've been asked to be part of the rebuilding there, in terms of the institutional rebuilding. And there were several people there, and including one of the ministers from the Haitian government, who were arguing that, you know, everybody's portraying Haiti as being just a total disaster, you know, a year later, it's still a mess, but they said it actually takes a long time mm -hmm. for people, countries to rebuild after disasters. You know, even after the tsunamis, which didn't in fact destroy the government structure, I mean, in Haiti, I mean, a lot of their institutional structure was destroyed, you know, the people were in their offices, and the offices fell down, and, you know, so far, so much for the people who were uh, the administrators and bureaucrats, whatever. And the argument was that, in fact, it wasn't such a disaster, that things were moving ahead. But, of course, then cholera comes. And, you know, they're all, the, I mean, it's really uh, just a, a terrible, kind of unfortunate set of terrible circumstances all at once. But I think that, you know, Haiti's never, you know, the, the government and democracy has never been very strong there. So. Uh, but, but isn't that where the international community should come into play? I mean, we've got an international crisis group, we have a United Nations, we have groups like the Club of Madrid and others um, who spend time bringing together incredible minds to think through the process of democracy and think about ways of fostering democracy. Is that not when the international community needs to mobilize and support? Well, I think they are, and I think people are there, but you know, you can't, people have such short attention spans now. You sort of think you must be able to do things right away. Here you have people who are still living in tents. Now, they've actually been doing a lot. So one of the people was commenting that, you know, journalists go there after a year and they still see rubble in the streets in the city. So they say, oh, there's still rubble in the streets. It's a mess. But what they don't understand is that the rubble that was on the main streets has all been cleared away. But the big trucks, machines that go and pick up the rubble, from the small street, they can't go into the small streets. So during the night, the people pick up the rubble from those streets and deposit them on the main streets where they can be picked up by the big trucks. So people come and they see there's still rubble on the main streets, but they don't realize that that rubble represents what has been collected during the night from the areas that big machines can't get into. And that gradually, the rubble is in fact being cleared away. So you have to know what you're looking at. And you have to not sort of put your head on other people's shoulders or just assume because you were there a year ago, you go back a year later and you know what's going on. You have to know what you're seeing. And the things that I was hearing at that meeting were, were actually quite optimistic about the ability of Haitians to get it together. But if you look, I mean, look, at, look at the United States for a minute. The United States Congress has become dysfunctional. And the old sort of traditions of bipartisanship, of coalitions across party lines and whatever, seems to have been completely discredited. What is happening there? Now, do we say America's going to hell in a handbasket at the end of the democracy? I don't think so. I think you say America's going through a really <coughs> bad time. And there are a whole variety of factors. The, the, the role of money in elections, the role of, of a very polarized media, I think even the change of the FCC regulations requiring <coughs> balance has created a polarized medium where people watch the, the stations that confirm their prejudices. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. And you think, what's going to happen there? But I'm convinced that it will write, it will be right. Excuse me. <coughs> Not that it will write itself, but that people will write it that you'll get to a point where people will say enough is enough. 
and the kind of know-nothingness that you see in a lot of the political discourse, the magical thinking. Um, you know, all of this is stuff that, that I think will respond to a different way of thinking, but sometimes you have to get into a crisis. Excuse me. <coughs> we are going to have time for I your did, questions. I just want to blow so your head off. If, uh, <laughs> People are thinking that they would like to ask a question of the Right Honourable Kim Campbell. Um, we are moving in that direction now, so we want to make sure that you have plenty of time. But I would say that we are here to hear Kim Campbell this afternoon, and I would like it if you would ask questions. Um, and if you have some comments that you want to make after, maybe we can take the time to hear those. But if you ask questions, that would be much appreciated. Um, just very quickly, what's going on with the Tea Party? You mentioned anger in politics uh, early on in your comments this afternoon. Well, I'm, I'm touched that you think I would be you know, an expert on that, because I'm not. I, I actually live in Europe most of the time, and most of my work is outside of North America. Um, but watching from a distance. But, well, yeah, no, I mean, I certainly pay attention, and I, and I read the, the, I get the Herald Tribune, International Herald Tribune, which is the New York Times in Europe, and I read it pretty carefully. Um, but again, it's this, the, the, the ironic thing is that the original Boston Tea Party wasn't a protest against taxes as such. It was a protest against taxation without representation. And in the same way that people are forever nattering about the market and let markets rule and go to Adam Smith, and they've never read Adam Smith. <laughs> you know, for Adam Smith, the notion of an unregulated market would be anathema. He was a moralist. He was a key thinker of the Scottish Enlightenment. And he believed very strongly in fellow the, the, the thinkers of the Scottish Enlightenment kind of had moved away from religion. They saw religion as being very dogmatic and very divisive of people. And they said that the, the fundamental basis of human morality is fellow feeling, empathy. And you have to feel for your fellow people. And what Adam Smith is talking about in The Wealth of Nations and the other things that he wrote is when he talks about the market, he's talking about it as a device and a mechanism. And it is a phenomenal device and mechanism for aggregating decisions. But he never for a nanosecond believed that it should just be allowed to run while he talks about, you know, big, uh, you know, financial interests and, and business people as being very selfish, as people having to be constrained. And so you get this incredible, you know, these, these pundits and these people, and politicians blathering on about the market and how un-American it is to have any kind of, you know, Obama's a socialist. I mean, go to school if you think he's a socialist. <laughs> Honestly, you know. So, uh, no, I mean, the mind boggles. I mean, you know, talking about people, you know, living the present differently. I mean, some of us are old enough to remember what socialism really is. And <laughs> this is the guy that just saved capitalism. And all the people on the left are mad at him for saving capitalism. All the people on the right are calling him a socialism. I don't socialist. I think you just give up and go home to Chicago. Um, <laughs> you don't really. No, no, but I guess Chicago's a great city. But anyway, um, but it's, but it's this, this, this incredible, you know, people that gather, grab the symbolism and they're angry. And incidentally, I see nothing wrong with people being angry, but it seems to me they're angry at the wrong people. You know, I mean, and, and George W. Bush, who also manages, seems to have managed to plagiarize his memoirs. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't you think in the era of the internet that's kind of risky? This I mean, afternoon's event is online. being podcast. <laughs> no, but I mean, no, no, but you know, no, but, I mean, professors can go online now and they can find, you know, they've, through content analysis, that people are handing in papers that have been plagiarized. But, you know, maybe he's not big on the internet, I don't know. But, you know, here, is, here was eight years of kind of disaster, you know, and tax cuts for the rich, which did not trickle down. And all of these things, and, you know, we'll, we'll, take, we'll give the rich a trillion dollars back in their tax, but we'll also have a war which costs another trillion dollars. So the net loss is two trillion dollars, which you poor people are going to pay. Oh, thank you. And now we're going to boot those Democrats because they didn't fix it overnight. I don't know. I just don't understand. <laughs> but anyway, it's so the Tea Party, you know, is, is, is I, I quite understand why people are angry. Mm. But I do think that there ought to be some kind of rational process to figure out who you ought to be angry, whom you ought to be angry at. And that I don't quite understand. But that's one of the joys of democratic politics. Okay, there's a young man right uh, toward the top. There you are. Could you please stand? And I'm going to have to restate your question so that everyone can hear you.
Okay. So um, uh, the, the, the preamble was to address the question of poli the politics of anger. And uh, the questioner is asking um, whether Ms. Campbell has some comments on the election of Rob Ford, the man who um, swept the election in Toronto just a few weeks ago. Um, on the, uh, the headline was, um, stop the gravy train. That was kind of his thing about government should be streamlined and any comment? Well, as you will understand, because we're all Vancouverites here, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about Toronto politics. <laughs> <laughs> But in so far as one is forced to do so, um, they get what they deserve there, the old people. Anyway, Hogtown. But, um, you know, these are phenomena that come up regularly in politics. And I, I understand that was a election where there was a lot of twittering and whatever. And good for them. Um, but, you know, I, I have the same feeling about that that I have about, about Preston Manning, who I think has a lot to answer for, because Preston Manning created a political movement that was based on the notion that politicians were a bunch of crooks and they were all at the trough. And of course, finally, he gets enough people elected to go off to Ottawa, and they discover that that isn't really true, and that it's really expensive to be a member of parliament, and that thanks to the kind of things that they say about politicians, nobody wants to hire you if you're out of office. Uh, I mean, unless you happen to have been Prime Minister, which is a little bit more helpful, but, uh, but that's a small uh, pool. Um, and so the notion of, 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 again, making people angry. I mean, if there are legitimate problems or, or scandals or misuses of, of money, and I don't know what the background of this was in Toronto, but for example, in the British House of Commons, they had this expenditure scandal. And, and you know what it was created by? It was created by the fact that they couldn't simply decide to give a given housing allowance to members of parliament to come and, and, and live in London. If they'd said, as we have here, you know, a housing allowance that you can spend, and except if, if you actually already live in the capital, you don't get it. But if you, if you have to live, here's what your housing allowance, and you do with it what you want. But because they thought, ooh, that would, you know, people might not like that. So instead, we'll let you claim expenses. Well, you know, so if it was a claiming the cleaning of his moat, I mean. <laughs> Well, you wonder what they're thinking, but then of course they assume it's all going to be kept secret, and of course nothing is secret in this day. So you need to have sensible rules about what you can and cannot do with public funds, what you can and cannot do with your expenses, and those rules need to be enforced, and people who breach them need to be embarrassed and turfed, or you know, maybe lose the election if they're allowed to run again, whatever. But the notion thus in general, that it's all a kind of a gravy train, unless you are prepared to demonstrate that, what you do is you just create, it's the politics of envy. It's the politics of anger. And to me, that's just a bad place from which to figure out how to live together in a society and how to make public policy. So, you know, there are lots of examples in this country of people winning elections based on those kinds of, of, of appeals. But at the end of the day, I don't think they wind up serving the voters very well. And, and I feel that way about, about the Reform Party, that I feel that, you know, and, and all the permutations and combinations and gymnastics and contortions that have gone through it for the Reform Party. And, you know, and I would say, people would interview me. I remember I was in London and somebody interviewed me. What, and I said, well, you know, I know my country. Canada is really quite a centrist country socially. And I don't believe that a party that's that socially conservative will ever form a majority government. I mean, they will have supports and God bless, you know, people are entitled to have their views and we have a lot of mix. But the nice thing about a big party is that people have to come together and they have to kind of sand off the, the extreme corners to begin to find a, a vision that they can support and move ahead on. And then I would get emails from people, you stupid, you lost, you terrible person. Who do you think you are? You know, oh, <laughs> it's really funny. I think like, don't shoot the messenger, honey. You know, I'm sorry, a party that's that socially conservative is not going to form a majority. Well, that became very clear. So then they contorted themselves, you know, we're not the Reform Party anymore, we're the Canadian Alliance. I don't know who we're allied with. <laughs> I don't know who we're allied with exactly, but we have hopes. You know, we have hopes. We have invitations out there. Come ally with us, even though we're really the Reform Party, but we're calling ourselves the Canadian Alliance. So then, you know, people are moving behind the scenes. They have to have an alternative to the Liberals, so, you know, the, the, the Tories are brought in, and some of the Tories are like, no. And quite rightly so, saying, you know, these people are, you know, intolerant, bunch of right-wing loonies. Now they're saying, oh, look, you know, you know, we've got to, you know, kind of provide an alternative party. So some of them, you know, let their pragmatism bring them into the party, and others of them 
you know, like Lowell Murray in the Senate of State. And so now you have the, the, the Conservative Party, which isn't, wasn't, isn't my old progressive conservative party. And, but again, it's very interesting. No majority. Why? Because people are a little bit worried. If they get a majority, might the wing nuts come out of the woodwork? I don't know. Uh, has he got them under control? Is this what they really are? Yeah. So the fact of the matter is, what Preston Manning started kind of disturbed a whole lot of things. And the old progressive conservative party, and I don't say it because that was my party and people were entitled to defeat us, but it was a kind of a big tent party that had a lot of really interesting people from different walks of life. We had some people who were very socially conservative. We had our red Tories. We had people from all across the country. And when you got together, we had to listen to one another. But we came together with a desire for public service and we kind of grew and learned. And of course, your constituents always blame you if you go Ottawa. But the fact of the matter is you get a sense of the country and you can begin to move ahead and provide an alternative to another party, which is also a big inclusive party, but has a slightly different political center of gravity. And that's, I think, what makes things work. And I think that, so your very long answer to your short question is, <laughs> <laughs> I distrust politics of anger and politics of, oh, they're all a bunch of crooks. Because my experience is that they're not, that they're mostly nice people whose communities say, you know, why don't you run? And they do it. Okay. Next question on the stairs. Thank you. So, um, Ms. Campbell, for those of us who are moderate conservatives who are not happy with the new conservative party, what should we do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I left the country. I don't know. What <laughs> is you have to decide you want to create your, a new vehicle, you want to work in an existing vehicle and try to change it. It is very hard. And it's sad when you feel that you'd like to be politically involved and you can't find a home. And it doesn't mean that you have to find your ideological soulmates. You have to find people who are prepared to make you part of the conversation and where you feel that you can make a contribution and help uh, create a sense of direction. And I, and I feel bad for people who feel that they can't find that. Um, and whether the current Conservative Party will ever move in that direction, I don't know. Uh, I think there are lots of, I mean, there are lots of former progressive conservatives in it. Uh, my old uh, uh, parliamentary secretary, uh, Rob Nicholson, who's, who's Minister of Justice, uh, is a very nice guy. He's more conservative than I am, but a very lovely guy. I mean, I think there are some good people there. But, you know, politics really isn't, you know, it, it's not a precision tool. You really have to kind of find the, you know, the people where you can kind of hang out and maybe make a difference, recognizing you're not going to agree with everybody, even in your own party. In fact, many of the most vicious political battles fought are fought within party caucuses. Yeah. Uh, so it's you know, as Harry Truman said, if you want to if you want a friend in Washington, buy a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Gentleman in the fourth row, sir. A constitutionally limited government. How does it tie in with your notion of democracy of working with democracy? Well, I, the, the question was. Was, was how, does, how does constitutionally limited government tie in with my notion of democracy? Well, constitutionally limited government is, is, is really the bedrock because to me, the most important thing about democracy is not elections. Elections are important. Elections are what give legitimacy to certain people to, to try and make policy within the democratic framework. But the more fundamental notion of democracy, I think, is rule of law. And the thing about rule of law is not that we have laws that we all have to obey, but we have laws that constrain the government. <laughs> And that's the, the most fundamental of those laws are the Constitution, where we say that, that you know, parliaments can't just adjust them by, by statute. So they're statute. There are fundamental uh, provisions in a Constitution. Now, different countries have different views of what those constitutional limits should be. You know, the Americans have separation of powers. We have parliamentary supremacy, but we still have, uh, and particularly even more so with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which enhance the right of the courts to find our laws consistent or not with provisions of our Constitution. Uh, we've always had the, the constitutional limits of our federal provincial jurisdictions, for example. But I think th those are really important. And they're not just important for making sure that we can constrain government. They're important because they communicate the ethos that government has to obey the law, that nothing puts you above the law, whether you're a prime minister, uh, whether you know, you're, you're a member of parliament, whether you're a mayor of a city, there is an, a, an underlying law. And now, in societies, you have to struggle sometimes to, to, to have those limits respected. And there are many countries that are not democratic who have, quote, these wonderful constitutions, like the Soviet constitution. Although the Soviet constitution had a great catch 22. 
because it had this wonderful provision, two provisions, one that said that the Communist Party was the leading organ of all society. So everything had to be read in light of the fact that the party could overrule it at any time. And they had this wonderful little provision that citizens shall enjoy their rights in exchange for performing their responsibilities. Mm. Ooh. Now, is there a catch-22 or not for you? In other words, you know, rights are not absolute. Rights are, you know, you're a good person. You'll get to have your rights. Mm. <laughs> Next question. Um, obviously, WikiLeaks has been a big issue in the news lately. Do you think that's a legitimate um, way to increase government transparency, or is it irresponsible to policy? Excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think, you know, you give me a plate of cookies, I'm going to eat one, you know. <laughs> if you put this in front of journalists, they're very likely to print it. And the New York Times went through a long explanation of how they, in fact, redacted a lot of stuff out of the WikiLeaks thing and were more uh, you know, responsible than the government. Two things about this. I'm very concerned that someone could hack into this diplomatic correspondence. I think the government needs to, you know, look, look at that. Because I do think that there is a legitimate expectation of privacy in certain kinds of communications. And, you know, if you send a diplomat out to a country and the diplomat wants to send back a candid assessment of somebody, that doesn't mean that this is your foreign policy. It means that this is a reading of what's there. So you could try to understand, you know, Muammar Gaddafi has a Ukrainian nurse who's always with him now. What's all that about? Is this just, <laughs> is this just hanky panky, you know, or is she some kind of Rasputnika or something? I don't know. The point is that you need to have this an anticipation of privacy in the same way that our, our private phone conversations have been, prote have been protected um, so that people can be candid and so that you can actually have an exchange of views. Because somebody might say something, somebody might say, well, that's actually wrong because I know such and such and such and, you know, I think your judgment's wrong and you get a big debate and people decide, you know, is Kim Jong-il crazy? Is Kim Jong-il just, you know, have a short man complex? Is Kim Jong-il... <laughs> I love Madeleine Albright's discussion in a memoir where she was, when she was with Kim Jong-il and she's standing next to him and she looked down and she realized they were both wearing high heels. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. And thank you for being my hometown. I love being here. I would now like to invite Mark Mahwini to the stage. He is with the UBC Alumni Association for closing comments. Thanks very much. It's a, it's a real pleasure for me to be here today, um, not only as a volunteer board member of the Alumni Association, but as a former staffer of uh, Prime Minister Kim, as we used to call you, in the Minister's Regional Office here in Vancouver. You don't contradict a Prime Minister when you work for them, but you, you did miss one detail uh, today, and that was in reference to the iterations of the Conservative Party. You forgot the Canadian Reform Alliance Party. It's <laughs> <laughs> actually known as CRAP. <laughs> Um, I think that her, uh, the Prime Minister's messages around democracy um, were particularly salient given uh, the audacity of hope in the United States, a groundbreaking election, uh, successive minority governments in Canada, um, and uh, um, the anti-HST and recall campaigns here in British Columbia. It's a very interesting time in politics and in democracy, and I think that we're very fortunate in Canada to live in a secure democracy, and even in an environment of minority governments, the government still does work and mm -hmm. it operates, and I think we're very fortunate uh, to live in a country like ours. So, um, one last thing, Kim, there's a job opening that might be coming in the federal scene. You've been the first female Prime Minister of Canada, for the Progressive Conservatives, I think you should run for the Liberal leadership. The <laughs> <laughs> Prime Minister to be the Prime Minister in both parties. <laughs> I'm, I'm not that big on first. <laughs> but thank you very much for taking the My time pleasure. with thank us you. today. It's
great to have an alum here with us, and uh, I thought the message was great, and it's always fun to listen to you speak, so thank you very much. And <laughs> often when I watch moderators, I, I judge how good they are with respect to how comfortable I feel, and I think Catherine did a great job. I felt like I was sitting in my own living room having a private conversation with Kim, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.